All right, hello my people. Hope we're doing okay. Um, this first video is going to be uh, really, really similar to uh, the first part of the class video. So if you've watched that instead, uh, you don't need to watch this. Um, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to again go over uh, the, uh, I'm again gonna go over the logic of transformations and the two questions which guide uh, those transformations of graphs uh, so that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, I mean, the way that I do it is not completely dissimilar, uh, but there are some differences from the way that I do it and the way that other teachers do it. Uh, there's also differences between the way I describe these things and the way that some of the textbooks describe them. So, like I said, just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, when it comes to these things. Now, what is the overarching logic of transformations? You know, kind of like, why are we doing, you know, what is, what is it, uh, what questions are we really, uh, well, now these are the questions that we're answering, but basically, what are we assuming when we do transformations, okay? And that, and that is when the form of the function changes, the graph changes, <clears throat> in predictable ways. An emphasis on predictable ways, right? You don't, you know, some people are confused by transformations, but you don't need uh, a shaman and a Ouija board to figure it out. Uh, it actually is really, really straightforward if you know what questions to ask. Uh, and that, of course, brings us to the second part. The two questions which guide us in the transformation of graphs uh, are, uh, and they both have two answers. Uh, the first one <clears throat> basically is uh, when, you, when you change the function, you are doing something to the variable, okay? Uh, and so when those things that are done to the variable, and for, for instance, y is equal to x squared is different than y is equal to x minus 2 squared, right? Uh, the minus 2 has been done, you know, to the function. It has been done to the variable. So those things that are done to the function, the first question is, uh, is it done before or after the named operation? Okay. And by named operation, I mean the thing that the thing uh, that gives the class of functions its name. So for the family of functions or the class of functions known as absolute value functions, the named operation is the absolute value. Okay. For quadratics, it is the squaring. For exponentials, it is the exponentializing. For for logarithmic functions, it is the log being taken. Uh, and for you know radical functions, it is uh, the radical being taken. So um, basically, we need to determine whether the thing that we're that we're focusing on at that particular moment has been done to the function before the named operation or after. And of course, if I'm talking about before and after, I'm talking about a particular order, and that order, of course, is the order of operations, all right? Uh, you learn that, and it never goes away. It just sort of drops below the surface and just sort of, and sort of, just sort of, it persists throughout the discussion of everything that we do in mathematics. The order uh, by which operations are done is always that PEMDAS that you learned in terms of order of operations. Now the second question is, is it multiplication, division, or is it addition, subtraction? Okay, and the reason why these are grouped, multiplication, division, uh, those are secretly the same operation, right? Uh, multiplication gets you order of magnitudes larger, division gets you order of magnitudes smaller. Uh, they're secretly the same thing, they just run in opposite directions. That's actually why they can be inverses of each other. Addition, subtraction, the same thing, right? Addition marches you one way up the number line, 
and subtraction marches you the other way down the uh, down the uh, number line. Now we have two questions, both of which have two answers. So we're going to do it all logic wise, and we're going to plop it here into a nice neat little chart. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, let's put the before and after up here. And let's put the multiplication and division and the addition subtraction here on the side. Now, the, imp like the significance of those questions is that when you are dealing with operations that are done before the primary operation, or what I've called the named operation, uh, those things are input based. And so let's go ahead and look down here. Uh, this is sort of a general form of any function and its transformations. So basically F stands for that named operation. So in an absolute value function, this F is the taking of the absolute value. In a quadratic, this F would be the squaring. In a radical function, this F would be the radical. So when we're talking about before the primary or named operation, we're talking about B and C right here, okay? Uh, but if it's done before, okay, it is an input-based transformation. Input-based meaning, uh, when we're speaking graphically, it affects the horizontal axis, the, the horizontal back and forth uh, in terms of graphing and the picturing of the function. If it is after, it is an output-based transformation. If it is multiplication division, uh, multiplication division is a change in shape. <clears throat> and if it is addition subtraction, it is a change in location. And that shouldn't surprise us. That's actually the same way we actually do uh, computation when we're looking at it on the number line. Uh, if I take a starting value of two and I add three to it, I march three units up the number line to five. If I multiply it by three, I'm increasing it by an order of magnitude, not a specific number of, of places, right? So it, so basically addition subtraction will march you unit by unit back and forth on the number line. Whereas uh, when you're dealing with multiplication, it stretches across the number line or shrinks. And of course, that should make sense to us. Uh, all the Cartesian plane is, is just two number lines at a right angle uh, that create a plane. Now, let's, let's relate this down to what we have down here. C right here is the first thing to be done, right? So let's just say, just for instance, if I plugged in a value for x, right? If I plugged in 4 for x, the first thing that I would do in terms of order of operations is I would subtract c. Now that is addition subtraction, and it is before the, the named operation, and so c is right there. It is a input change in location. It is a horizontal shift. Okay, well, let's look at B. B is multiplication division, but it's still before, okay? This is our horizontal uh, stretches and shrinks, as well as our x axis, as well as our y axis reflections. Then the named operation takes place, and then I have multiplication division after, and that is A, and that is either x axis reflection based upon its positiveness or negativeness and it is a shrink or a stretch based upon its magnitude, right? <clears throat> and then of course, D right here is after the named operation and it is a addition subtraction. It is a change in location on the output. These are your vertical shifts. And the reason I did it in that order is because that's the order of operations. And of course that helps us to sort of see the reason that I go. Now there are reasons why I focus on the order that they're done in and that will become evident here before long. Uh, but it's important that we sort of, that we parse this out and get a, and get a uh, understanding of what all this means because this is the language that I will use every time we talk about graphs. Now before we move on to specific examples, let's actually talk about uh, our B and our C value.
Because B and C, as you know, as you've probably been told and you've probably noticed, act differently than A and D do. Uh, and in the past, I've asked students this. I said, okay, why is it that when I add one right here, plus one is positive, but why does it move me in the negative direction? And of course, hands go up and the answer is predictably because it's opposite, which doesn't really answer the question. I've asked why is it, and I've just been told it is. Uh, I want you to understand why the plus one moves us in the negative direction. So let's go ahead and look at uh, the difference. Uh, basically, I want to compare x squared and x plus one squared uh, in order to be able to, and if I compare them, then I'll be able to see numerically why this is. Now, if I plug in zero, I'm gonna get zero squared, zero. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, and five squared. That shouldn't be all that difficult. When I plug in one, when I plug in zero over here though, I'm gonna get one squared. When I plug in one, I'm going to get two squared. When I plug in two, I'm going to get three squared and four squared and five squared and six squared. Now, if you'll notice that these are of course the same outputs, they're just at different inputs and that's what the shift really is. It is taking outputs and associating them with a different input. And notice that this maps onto this one. Well, why? Well, here's the thing. If I want one as an output for x squared, I simply have to plug in one. But if I want one as an output here, I can't plug in one. There's already a one right there. So x has to be one unit more negative to compensate for that plus one. And the same thing is true here. If I want an output of four, I have to plug in a two into x squared. If I want an output of four over here, I have to plug in a number that is one unit more negative to compensate for the fact that there's already a plus one right there. So in the end, the plus one is not your transformation. The plus one is, I mean, the, your transformation is what must x be to compensate for plus one, and it must be one unit more negative. And that's why it moves us to the left. Now it's the same, that's of course a C value. It's the same thing with a B value. If I plug in zero here, I'm going to get zero squared and one squared and two squared and three squared and four squared and five squared. Now, if I plug in zero right here, I'm still gonna get zero squared, but if I plug in two right here, I'm gonna get one. And if I plug in four right here, I'm gonna get four. And if I were to plug in six here, it's 36. Here, however, it's nine. And what happens here is x has to be half as, it has to be twice as big in order to get the same output, right? Because of the one half there, I can't plug in a one if I want a one. I have to plug in something that is twice as big. If I want a four, I can't plug in a two. I have to plug in something that is twice as big, okay? Um, if I want a nine, I can't plug in three. I have to plug in something that is twice as big. So the one half is not your transformation. What X must be to compensate, meaning twice as big, that is your transformation. Now, the clever ones among you, or just the ones that are, you know, awake and not asleep right now, um, <clears throat> the clever ones among you are thinking to yourself, well, that's all well and good. And that explains why B and C act in that opposite sort of way. But what about A and D? Why don't they? I'm so glad you asked. If I have A times F of B, X minus C, 
plus D. Now remember when I said if it occurs before the primary operation or the named operation, it affects the input. Now input is not always X, but in this case it is X, okay? So basically the, the um, what you see here is you see B and C affecting X, and where are they? Well, they're right next to X. X is right there. But A and D affect Y. Okay, A and D are right here, but Y is way over here. Now, here's the thing. If you were to take A and D uh, and put them over next to the next to the variable that they actually impact, they would act in that compensating sort of way, okay? So the reason that A and D act in a way unlike B and C is because A and D are sort of away from home because they are away from the variable that they impact. If they were over here next to the variable that they impacted, they would behave in exactly the same way that B and C do. And you would talk, and we would talk about those vertical, those output transformations as being compensating transformations for A and D. But we, because, you know, partially because um, of our, partially because, it's, excuse me, it's just nicer and neater, but partially because of our calculator age, we like our functions to be explicitly stated in terms of y equals. You know, the all important y equals is what causes us to entertain a and d as uh, over here away from home, sort of away from the variable that they, that they impact. Now, uh, this has all been sort of abstract because I've been talking about sort of uh, some function f, okay? Uh, and I want to drive it home just a little bit. And so I wanted to sort of give you this in terms of the different classes of functions that you've actually already seen. And so instead of f, here I have the absolute value bars. And we see bx minus c in terms of the order of operations happening before the absolute value bars and the A and the D happening afterwards. And if, of course, you want to, you know, you want a more numerical example, you have this, okay? The plus four and the times one half or divided by two, my C value and my B value would be, would be, uh, would be done, uh, if you were to plug in a value for X, they would be done to that value before you then took the absolute value. And of course, the three and the negative one, three and the minus one would happen afterwards. And the same thing with the squaring right here, and the same thing with the radical, and the same thing with the exponentializing, not a real word, by the way, and the same thing with the logging, the logarithm, okay? Uh, and basically, you just need to be able to discern what is being done before and what is being done after. You need to be able to discern the order in which uh, the transformations are happening. And, and uh, that's gonna become important here, uh, especially by the time we get around to radical functions. Not, not quite as important here on absolute value and quadratics, but I'll explain that a little bit more uh, probably in the next video. Uh, we'll go ahead and call this one uh, to a close. And in the next video, I will start doing examples uh, from these five and perhaps even more classes of functions uh, in order to sort of refresh your memory. Because uh, when we get to the transformation of trigonometric graphs, I, I want the only difficulty for us to be the trigonometric graphs. If we are basically grasping after those things which we should have down uh, and, and we're not remembering our, our, the procedures by which we identify the transformation of graphs, um, then we are basically doubling our work on any particular section, and, which of course is the entire reason we're having this summer trig course, right? Uh, we don't want to be concentrating on that which is assumed 
because it then makes what we're the new stuff that we're learning that much more difficult. Uh, so please, please, please do reach out to me if you are struggling with transformations in general, uh, <clears throat> or just you know watch more of the videos. Uh, and but we will go ahead and get to that in the next video. Okay, I wanted to sort of chop this off right here uh, so that those who those who watch the class video didn't have to go back through all of. Uh, all of this sort of preliminary explanation uh, before getting to the examples. But uh, as always, if you have any questions, shoot me a chat or an email. Bye.